you know, imagine you had somebody that said, Hey, Bobby, I love your podcast. The recent episode you did with Jen really got me thinking about how I could pitch to the media. I really appreciate you sharing that, that content. It's so on par with all of the other helpful content that you share, helpful episodes you have, you know, you've really added a lot of value to my business. You know, something along those lines, like one sentence, two sentences, where now you're paying yep. attention because this yep. person clearly listened to your show and they know what you're talking about. And they're saying, I appreciate your work and, you know, thank you for that. Yep. And now you have an automatic understanding that that person knows what you're all about. So probably the pitch that follows is going to be relevant for you. Welcome to the Online Genius Podcast, where host and renegade thinking beer brewing lawyer turned online entrepreneur Bobby Clink proves that building and protecting your online genius doesn't have to be rocket science. Bobby and his expert guests break down online marketing and the legal stuff so you can stop sweating the small stuff and get back to building your amazing business. Now, here's your host, Bobby Kling. Hey there, welcome to episode 83 of the Online Genius Podcast. I'm your host, Bobby Clink, and I'm excited for today's show for a couple of reasons. One, we're talking about a topic I love, which is pitching yourself to as an entrepreneur to people. But I'm also excited because it's an interview with one of my friends and one of my friends who I know in the entrepreneurship space, but as with a few different people I've interviewed already, she's also a recovering lawyer. So I can relate to her that way. My guest today is Jennifer Burson, or I call her Jen Burson. She's the president and founder of Generation PR, which is with a J, a public relations and social media marketing firm specializing in promoting beauty, baby, and lifestyle brands. Jen's retainer clients range from small and mid-sized brands to multi-billion dollar publicly traded companies and everything in between. She's also the creator of The Agency Accelerator, where she teaches entrepreneurs how to launch, grow, and scale a profitable PR and marketing agency. And she also recently launched Press Success, a PR masterclass for entrepreneurs to learn the step-by-step framework for executing a PR strategy that converts into massive media placements for their business. In other words, she does a lot. She has an agency that she runs. She's also teaching other people how to build agencies, but she's also got resources to help teach entrepreneurs like you and me how to use PR in our business. So she's doing a lot of good in the world. But like I said, prior to forming her PR firm, she was a lawyer and practiced what's called civil litigation, which is basically the kind of things that I did as a lawyer, um, suing you know, one company suing another company, but basically fighting about money. But eventually she saw the light and left to start her own business and pursue more creative endeavors. And she didn't just dip her toe in the water. She basically made a clean break and went the PR route. So she's been, you know, very successful since doing that. She's been featured in the New York Times, Forbes, Inc.com, Business Insider, Yahoo Finance, Entrepreneur Magazine, Huffington Post, EO Fire, CBS.com. PR week, and I could keep going and going and going. The point is, Jen knows what she is talking about. And she's not just someone who knows about pitching. I, I'm, I'm in a mastermind with her, and she has a knack for messaging, which is also an important piece of the pie or piece of the puzzle if you are an online entrepreneur. So in this interview, we talked all about how to successfully pitch yourself. And that might be pitching yourself to a PR agency or to a, not a PR agency, but to actually a publication. But it might also be pitching yourself to a podcast like people pitching themselves to me. And we talk about how to do it right, what people do wrong, the mistakes they make, and everything in between. And I can tell you, I've seen a lot of people do this wrong. I will have people pitch me for my podcast and the pitch is just all wrong. Now, a lot of people pitch me and I I don't necessarily have them on the show, but it's not because they did it wrong. But then there are the people who pitch me. They clearly have never listened to the show or never really tried to understand what I'm doing or who I'm serving. And so they're just making a generic pitch. And, you know, we talk about the things that, you know, you need to do and, and ways to do it right during the interview. It is a great interview. Jen offers some great insights and great information. And again, if you are 
trying to get your business built, pitching yourself to whether it be, you know, people with platforms, people who are in your dream 100 that I've talked about that concept before, podcasts, publications, etc. All of that can be a hugely important part of building your business. So I hope you'll give it a listen and I hope you enjoy it. And if you haven't yet, make sure to like and subscribe to the show. I would love a rating and review on the i um, or I, I shouldn't say iTunes anymore since it's no longer iTunes, but on the Apple Podcast app uh, or wherever you listen to your podcast. But without further ado, here's my interview with Jen Burson. Well, welcome to the show, Jen. I am so glad you're here. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to chat with you. Now I'm excited to talk about, you know, pitching yourself to to different people and and hopefully we can get people not to do what a lot of people do when they try to pitch themselves to me for my podcast. But before we get there, I do like to kind of share a little bit about my guest's kind of personal, you know, life. And you shared with me that you and your husband were on HGTV. Is that right? <laughs> Yeah, that's right. So, so, so tell that story. And it wasn't about pitching yourself. That wasn't what you were doing. What were you on the uh, on that network for? Oh my God! Well, you, it, it actually did start with a pitch, right? You got to yeah, convince obviously. them that you're going to be great on camera. But we were on a a one season show, <laughs> and I'll tell you why it only lasted a season. But it was called HGTV like HGTV apostrophe D. Okay. And it was a show for HGTV super fans. Hi, that's me. And you would get a all expense paid dream makeover for one room in your home. And it was one of the network's design stars. So every episode had a different designer that would kind of uh, create the design. And it was a surprise who you got. And they ended up coming and doing, I'm I'm sitting in the room right now. So I'm like kind of looking around and feeling really inspired and and grateful being in this room, but it's my home office, which is a a great room in our house. It's kind of like this all purpose room. So half of it's my office and the other half is like a big couch that our whole family flops on and we watch TV and movies and we have a fireplace and it was tan, brown, boring when they came and they just created this beautiful space. And it's funny because I had been warned by so many people that they just create things that sort of look good on camera. And the second they leave, the whole place is falling apart and everything's <laughs> junky and they spill paint everywhere. And that could not be further from our experience. I mean, this room is just gorgeous and the workmanship they did is beautiful. They put up this really cool wallpaper and they installed slate up the walls for the fireplace, put in a new fireplace, like beautiful chandelier. It's just so awesome. And they were so like gracious to be in our house and really, I mean, this was now eight years ago. My, my older son who just turned nine, he was a baby, but they were in and out in four days. And I have this space now that I feel really inspired to be in. I work in here every day and I just kind of look around and it just reminds me how lucky I am and grateful I am to, you know, get to work in this beautiful space. Uh, you lost me at wallpaper. Um, <laughs> it's part- really cool wallpaper. <laughs> no, no, you lost not me. not like your me. grandma's wallpaper. <laughs> no, that's not why you lost me. Why you lost me is my parents love wallpaper and my dad is a do-it-yourselfer. So I many times had to help him strip wallpaper. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. I wouldn't fun thing to do. Down. No, that's not, no, I will no. never be doing that, but so, yeah. So- so you said you were going to tell us why you think it failed. So why do you think it only uh, lasted one season? Well, because there, so when they say no expenses spared, there was no DIY component. There was no, you know, here's how to get the look for yourself. So, you know, HGTV is one of these right. kind of voyeuristic networks where people can learn and figure out how they can get these looks for themselves. And they do things kind of on a budget or it's like really inspiring. This was you know, I mean, and lucky for us, right. But we got like beautiful furniture and high end pieces. They gave us this incredible coffee maker because part of the room is set up like a little, a little bar as if I was serving my clients coming to visit me in my home office. So we had a bar cart and a actual coffee bar and they (laughs) gave us this insane, crazy coffee maker that has 
no joke, biometric tech- technology where you put your thumbprint on it and it saves your coffee preferences. <laughs> They're not super relatable, right? And like people are not going to Amazon and buying this like multiple thousand dollar coffee maker, but we sure, we sure appreciate it. So I think the complaint was that it, it, it didn't appeal to the masses. It was too, too fancy pants, but it really was great for us. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. I mean, yeah. <laughs> if you're going to be on one of the shows, that's the one to be on, I guess. Oh yeah. We really lucked out. My husband was like, we were going to get on a show. We super lucked out getting on this one because they really, you know, spared no expense. And it was really dialed in with our taste and how our family lives. Like it definitely was thoughtful how they, how they pulled it all together. And like I said, eight years later, I'm still so happy to get to work in this space. Well, that is good. But since we, we're talking about working, let's let's pivot now to what we're actually here to talk about, which is not HGTV, although mm-hmm. I can talk about that for a while because I've watched it many a day. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I you're, you came on here to talk about, in a sense, pitching yourself and you talk about media, but let me start there. When you say, you know, that you're going to help people pitch themselves and get themselves kind of featured in the media, how do you define media? I mean, media is anywhere that your audience is going to be hanging out or where you can use your story to like draw attention to yourself. So it's like, you know, anything from local news to podcasts, which is why you're obviously getting pitched quite a bit. Um, You have a platform to share people's story and expertise you know, it could be newspapers, magazines, other websites, guest writings on other people's blogs, any anywhere that you can kind of borrow somebody else's audience and platform to expand your reach and establish your expertise because you're being featured sharing your ideas or sharing your stories or sharing what you know how to do. So, you know, media, media can be anything. I mean, it used to be radio and TV more. You can try to get on a national TV show, but starting with local and kind of building up from there. And, you know, we see press as cumulative, so it doesn't hurt to start small and then it starts to snowball. So even the little guys, the little outlets, you know, lesser known podcasts are a great place to get started. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to ask the question, because I think a lot of people hear PR or media and they're thinking, you know, TV, they're thinking radio, they're thinking ink and and things like that. And and I like when I was, I was struck when I was listening to how you talk about pitching that really it's all the same, whether it's you're pitching a podcast or you want to write a blog post for someone or anything like that, that it really is the same process. And are there differences in how you pitch other than kind of little bits about messaging, or is it really the same regardless of the kind of media that you're reaching out to? Well, I think the main thing to keep in mind is you want to be targeted and strategic and make sure that the recipient of your email, because most pitching is done over email, is seeing that you're specifically tailoring your message to their platform or their outlet and their audience and their editorial focus. And so it's looking at the content that they normally write about or normally cover or feature, and even the specific features that they have. So sometimes there's recurring features that they do on a you know weekly basis or a daily basis or like a you know monthly basis. And it's the similar kind of feature that they they have over and over again or the type of story that they tell, you know, and looking at it and figuring out how you fit in with what they're already doing so that you're not trying to get them to envision how, how you could, how they could feature you, but you're trying to get them to envision how, what they're already doing would work really well. Your story would fit in really well, I should say, with what they're already doing. So you're positioning it in a way where you're being very clear that you know what their editorial coverage is, who their audience is, And you're figuring out a way that you can use your story or your expertise to add value. And that's the key is adding value there. Is there lessons learned that are relevant to their audience has to be highly relevant. So that's why you cannot pitch the same way to all publications because 
their audience is a little different and the things that they cover are a little different. And each editor or each journalist might also have a different beat that they cover or a different type of editorial focus within that publication. So it matters who you're pitching your story to. You want to start to look at what's being covered and who's covering it and start to figure out how you can fit into what they're already doing. It's not about just plopping in your story and saying, look, I exist. I'm cool. I'm smart. Here's my story. It's interesting. Boom. It's here's how it could work for what you're already doing because I'm an avid reader. I really love the publication. I'm a fan. I learn a lot from it. Your last article really resonated with me. I implemented the tips you shared and it had an impact on my business. So thank you for that. You know, sharing um, also gratitude for the work that they do because that'll get their attention and, you know, make it really genuine and show that you also have a great awareness of what they talk about. Yeah. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I get cold pitch emails for my podcast and I look at it and I'm like, I, I don't even understand how you, th- they clearly yeah. haven't listened to the show. They have no idea what it's about. They're just cold pitching everybody. And right. And I wonder how I get on their list. I'm like, I guess they just start, you know, creating a list of everybody because it, it, literally I've had people who are fiction writers just want to talk about their books. I'm like, no, no. <laughs> That literally has nothing to do with what I do. So no, thank right. you. And how off-putting is that, right? And you just think it's it's not only a no, it's kind of like a, you know, now I don't like you. <laughs> now <laughs> I realize you, you know, you don't care about me and the work that I do specifically because you're sending this mass pitch that doesn't indicate to me you understand who my audience is, what I talk about, and why what you are offering me is relevant. So if you can position yourself that way, when you reach out to each of these various types of media, then you're already ahead of the curve because really nobody does that. (laughs) It's very simple and no one does it. Well, the funny thing, Jen, is so again, if it's an individual, it's almost like, eh, you know, I mean, I don't want to say it's no skin off their back, but you know, that fiction writer, like, you know, it didn't matter what that person did. She was never going to be on my show. But I'm amused. There are podcasts like pitching services who I will get pitches from some of their people where it's like, clearly these people have not done research. And I'm like, okay, note to self, these people don't really do the work. And so it affects all of their clients. And theoretically, they should be good at it because they're in this business. So yeah, you know, this is a really good point because some people look at it like a numbers game and they just think that they can mass pitch with the same approach and eventually it will land. And that's the absolute worst approach. Um, yeah. I, I really position it more like a, like a quality over quantity thing and choosing a limited number of targeted strategic outlets that really make sense for you and your brand or your audience you're looking to build and positioning it specifically for that. So you can have the same core pitch the same core content. And I will say, keep it brief, keep it as succinct as possible. The purpose of a pitch is to get them to ask for more information, not to get a hard yes on your first email, right? So you don't need to give them every single thing because they'll just overwhelm them and they won't read it. But if you aim for quality and you go for the right strategic outlets versus, oh, let's just be general and send it out to as many as we can and something it's that throw spaghetti on the wall to see what sticks. And it could not be more opposite of what the right approach is. That's actually going to get the right meaningful coverage for you and your message. Well, it's it's hilarious that you talk about that because when I first started appearing on podcasts, I hired one of these services and it was like, we did it and there was like a, a certain number of shows they were supposed to get me on. And it was a lot because I was trying to do quantity over quality. And looking back, I'm like, some of those shows I was on, it was just ridiculous. There was no point of me being on that show, not because mm-hmm. numbers or anything, but because they didn't have my audience. Right. And yeah. now, I mean, I'd rather be on one or two shows that really fit, you know, my audience than, than be on 10 where it's a, eh. Yeah. So I think that's and an important point. It's good to know 
it's, I try to explain it this way to keep it as simple as possible. It's those outlets that you're reading or the podcast that you're listening to. And you, you feel like, my God, I, you know, I really could add value here. And my message is the right fit for their audience. And what they're already talking about really resonates with me. And I can fit in my content, my expertise, my approach, my story really well with what they're already doing. Because you figure when you're listening to it and you get that gut feeling, that aha feeling of like, this is where I should be. First of all, no one knows, you know, this agency doesn't know your message like you do. And, and they can be good, but you have to give them that guidance of what you want. I mean, I don't, you know, qual- quality over quantity is always the right approach. So you're going to be in the best position to know where you want to be, but it's a waste of your time. Exactly. Like you're saying, it's such a waste of your time to just go to these, like you have to spend the time to, you know, record it. And you're like, why did I do this? It's such a waste of time. So nobody knows better than you. And I just say, trust your gut on that feeling you get when you're listening and consuming that content. And you think this is where, this is where I need to be. Like, why am I not on this? This is exactly the right audience for me. You know, they need to share my message. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, so, so let's talk about that for a second, because I think a lot of, and I'll be honest, part of the reason why I kind of wanted to hire someone to do it is I, I was like, well, how do I even start the process of kind of putting together a list? And so how do you do that when you decide, hey, I'm going to make a, you know, I'm going to make a push to get some kind of, you know, media coverage uh, other than like podcasts. Oh, okay. Here are the ones that I know that I love that I listen to, et cetera. But, but in media, broader, how do you go about figuring out where you should want to be and where to pitch? Well, I think it helps, you know, first of all, what we just talked about, it's the publications you're reading and places that resonate with you, you know, where you think your target audience is. So that helps to start by really understanding who your target audience is and who you serve. And I know we, you know, we've done a lot of training programs together. We're in a lot of the same programs and they all start the same way. It's figuring (laughs) out, right? It all starts the same way. Who's your avatar? Who's your audience? Who do you serve? Right. So, you know, I know, I know you get that because we are like, (laughs) you're always, it's the first chapter in every program and you're like, okay, I've done this exercise 10 times now, but it's, it's really important if you haven't ever done it. And it doesn't have to be just one audience. It could be a couple different audiences, but you got to know who you're trying to talk to. And that's the first part. And then understanding your message. What is it that you can share? What can you contribute to? And it could be also seasonal. So it's something that you have to kind of time to be relevant with like a, an ideal time of year for that message. Like for example, if someone in your audience is you know, has anything to do with the fitness world. There's two kind of natural times to talk about fitness. It's right around New Year's with everyone getting into their resolutions. And then also with summer, right? When you're going to be peeling off the layers and (laughs) having more exposed skin, right? So there's two times of year that are really um, hot with the media to be talking about that. And you can tie the messaging into that. And then obviously you can stay relevant. The other times you just have to find other messages. You know, maybe it's like how to overcome like all the Halloween candy that you just ate and not overcome, but, you know, lose the weight from all the Halloween candy you just ate and pitch yourself right after Halloween and share tips there. So it's figuring out where that message will be the right fit because you're not going to really share that message with Inc or Forbes. You know, they're looking for more business related stories and strategies and stuff. So understanding who you're talking to and then what, message you can share and when is the right time to share it. And then you'll start to get a better sense of the publications, podcasts, TV shows, and other outlets that would be open to receiving that message, sharing it and featuring you on their platform. So, and I love that advice, but let me ask you a a question that just came to me as you were answering, because you talked about Inc. and Forbes and I don't even an entrepreneur, for example, will will have these stories about like the fifty must follow entrepreneurs. Are they creating that list? Are people pitching to be in those lists, or are they coming up with that on their own? Well, it depends. The answer is it depends. So sometimes they have you know the forty under forty. Those are right. their 
the, those are their lists, right? Um, yep. Sometimes they are contributor lists. You can start to look and see if those lists are an annual feature that they do. And it's something that they consistently do every year. And then you kind of know, and you can predict when it's going to come and see who covers it. Sometimes there's multiple contributors and you can start to, you know, kind of see who's writing and, and who's possibly worth reaching out to and sharing your message with. And you can also see how they're positioning each person that they choose and figure out how you can talk about what you do and how you serve and what your audience looks like to position it in the way that they're already talking about these people they choose for those lists. Sometimes they're contributor lists that third parties, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of guest contributors to these platforms because they need so much content, you know, they're using not just their in-house editors, but freelancers, and then also guest contributors, because it gives you a platform. And that's another thing your audience can consider doing is reaching out to the publications that do feature guest editors and pitching themselves as guest contributors. You know, you have to provide quite a bit of content and some don't pay, um, which is fine because you do get the exposure and there's some cachet by saying you're a contributor to Inc. or entrepreneur. Yep. Um, but it depends, you know, with the, with those lists, some of them are one-off lists. Some of them are annual lists. The ones that are annual are definitely inside of the publication with their editors, but they could be repurposed content from, I've even seen Quora responses from that get a lot of traction, get repurposed over to those publications. I was actually featured in one on Inc., that was a one, top 100, not a list of people to follow, but what was it? It was something like top 100 ways to achieve your dreams or something. And they, one of the tips was my story and the article got, somebody shared it. I, it wasn't me that shared it, but it, the article got picked up by Inc. And this guy that wrote it had, this was a strategy of his to get a lot of mainstream media. He started to get a lot of upvoted content on Quora and the big publications took notice and a lot of his content has been re rerun and he actually writes articles and saves them until there's a question that gets asked where it's a good fit and then he posts it and then he pushes it out to his network and asks them to upvote it and to comment on it so that he gets that instant push it's an interesting strategy and it's worked out really well for him but that's one way also to have your content kind of broadcast over to these other platforms. Yeah, and and I've heard people talk about Quora and those things, but but I, I actually want to throw you a curveball. I don't know if <laughs> you're going to have a good answer to this one because it's it's something that it's not unique. The particular issue is not unique to me, but it's it's different. My audience is predominantly female. I, I guess it's about eighty percent female, and my. Avatar hangs out listening to a lot of shows that are very much directed to women. And that creates an issue for me because they often are almost exclusively interviewing, talking about women. So how can you kind of do a pitch in that context where you serve their audience, can help them, but are not the typical person that they would have on because of gender or what you do or something like that? Well... I, so, I mean, I guess that is a curveball because I don't personally think that that should have an impact unless a show is literally specifying that they only will feature female guests. Right, right. What you can do is, you know, as long as what message you're sharing and strategies and tips that you're giving serve everyone and specifically, you know, if they do help women, it can help to have your students, your audience, and their successes illustrate your approach. So you can, you know, come in and say whatever the big, you know, overall messages that you would want to share, like seven strategies for female entrepreneurs to protect themselves and their businesses online, you know, let's say, knowing your content. And then as you pitch, maybe you give two or three of the tips and then say, 
the other tips, you know, if we decide to move forward, I'm happy to summarize them or just we can talk about it on your show. But when you share those two or three tips to entice them, you can use your student successes that are that are female to illustrate how you serve that audience, you know, as a way to kind of bridge that gap. I, I, I laughed there for a second because I was thinking about my testimonials. I think I literally only have one testimonial from a guy. I think all my, I think literally all my testimonials are from women other than that one. So, well, I love that you're serving, you know, helping women grow their businesses. I mean, we, you know, I, I see mostly in my program too, it's women. And I think that there's a different mindset now, you know, back when I made the pivot, cause you know, I'm, I was, I am a lawyer. I'm maybe you mentioned in the, at the top yep. of the yep. call. Um, and when I, what, first of all, I looked around and there were no women. This was now 15 years ago. And, and before that, when I, I practiced for four years, there were no women that I could say, Oh, look at her life. Like that looks like an awesome life. You know, she's <laughs> a partner, she's making great money. She's home with her kids for their, you know, plays and recitals and sporting events. They are getting great cases and also have super flexibility with their lives to, you know, be where they want to be when they want to be. They're working whenever they want to work and also supporting their families. And I just did not have a model for that when I was a litigator and things may be maybe different now. I don't know, but I decided the kind of life that I wanted to have and it wasn't that, you know, so I don't even know why I brought that up. <laughs> I don't even know the reason I brought this up. Jen, if it makes you feel better, like I looked around when I was at big law firms and there were no role models like I want that person's life either. Yeah, um, right? I I'm mean, with you. Like, mm-hmm. Oh, so my point is, so things have changed. But back when I started my business, there wasn't a path where I could, there wasn't somebody that I could say they did it. They have the model for how this is done and I'm going to follow in their footsteps and create a business and a life and have it all kind of work together and have my business serve my life in a way where I'm able to set my own schedule and work with whoever I want to work with and have that ultimate freedom and flexibility. To me, that is what success looks like. And I think in the last, you know, for me, I've been doing this 15 years, but I would say probably the last like seven or fewer years, there's been a big shift and elite, you know, in a, in a positive direction where women are saying, you know, there's a model for me to have it all. And I, I'm not going to be made to feel guilty that I want to be a mom and also have a career. And, you know, it, we're, we're unapologetic about it. And we're now saying that this is accepted. And there's a lot of avenues to do that. You can go and have a career in somebody else's company or start your own company or work part time or create products online. You know, there's a million paths to do it. So I do see a lot of women coming into the, into my program, at least into my agency accelerator and, and seeing that there is a path and a model and a way to have it all in their definition, you know, be a parent and have flexibility, make good money and, you know, support their family and do it on their terms. So yeah. I love that your audience is mostly women because they're, we're stepping up in a big way. Well, well I also have theories about it, including that, it's because I don't have pictures of Lamborghinis and private jets, which is the more <laughs> ridiculous male driven marketing that, that some of the online space have. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it, it's a funny note that you mentioned the, the, the legal career. My class in law school was the first year that there were more women than men in a Harvard law school iterating class. So my class was literally the first time that women surpassed men. So. Wow. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. And you know, that's, that was in the 2000s when I actually graduated. It started in 99, but so, you know, it's not a, it's a relatively new, new recent trend, but luckily we're moving the right direction. Yeah. I was a year ahead of you, yeah. not at Harvard, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I like to say that that's one of the least good things about me. Um, that I went there, <laughs> Yeah. I know you personally, and there's a lot of, a lot of redeeming qualities too, but I love hearing that that's the, the change. I mean, that was, you know, now, several years, you know, what, 15 years ago or more, more than 15 years ago. So it's awesome to hear that shift. And I think even my class, so many of the women have gone on to do other things. And, you know, we all get together and we're like, well, we have the law degree and it's not a bad thing to have, but a lot of them aren't really, you know, practicing anymore or the ones that do, they have 
figured out ways to also be parents and have a life and, yeah. you know, they're mo- moved away from the big firm vibe. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So we got off on this tangent. We should really get back to <laughs> So, so once you've identified places to pitch that you want to be on, you know, whether it's podcast on there, a guest post on their blog, pitch them to be featured in an article, what do you do then? Do you, do you just start reaching out or is there work you need to do before you reach out? Well, you definitely want to figure out your message and your pitch angle. What are you going to offer them that's going to add value to their listener audience, their readership or whatever editorial coverage they normally feature. And so, you know, this all comes down to the pitch. Well, I would say it comes down to the pitch and the follow-up. You definitely want to have a plan in place to follow up after you send the pitch. I mean, even us with the PR agency and established media relationships, most of our features come after a follow-up email. So it's not really going to happen the first time and don't be discouraged. It's, it's okay to follow up and follow up again. Don't be annoying, you know, be helpful. A lot of times your pitch is sitting in their inbox and they just are busy and they haven't had a chance to get back to you, but send a pitch email and you want to think of your subject line, like a way to get their attention. Don't be gimmicky. Don't be obnoxious, but it does not have to summarize the entire email that you send. It's just a way to get their attention. So it can be, you know, kind of like a headline almost like something that would get them to click. Like if they were actually reading the article, it'd be interesting and enticing for them. So that's the purpose of the subject is to get them to read the email. And the purpose of the email is just to get them to respond. So you can have a dialogue. So like I said before, do not feel that you have to write your entire article or your entire background the more info you give, the more you overwhelm. You just want to get them to respond to you for more, you know, so give them a call to action at the end, the next step that they can take to move forward with you. And then if you have your article, you know, first thing I would do, your article angle, I should say, the first thing I would do is connect personally with the journalist that you're reaching out to, the podcast, you know, the podcast host, you know, imagine you had somebody that said, Hey, Bobby, I love your podcast. The recent episode you did with Jen really got me thinking about how I could pitch to the media. I really appreciate you sharing that, that content. It's so on par with all of the other helpful content that you share helpful episodes you have, you know, you've really added a lot of value to my business. You know, something along those lines, like one sentence, two sentences where now you're paying yep. attention because this yep. person clearly listens to your show and they know what you're talking about. And they're saying, I appreciate your work and, you know, thank you for that. Yep. And now you have an automatic understanding that that person knows what you're all about. So probably the pitch that follows is going to be relevant for you. Right. So yep. that's how you start it. And then the pitch can be just sharing your story idea and you don't even need to give your entire background, give a sentence or two and summarize your pitch, your idea with bullets and just give a couple bullets and say, you know, I'd love to move. If you're interested in moving forward with this, I'd love to give you the whole article or give you more context around how I think that I could position this for your, for your readers, you know, and then follow up with the call to action, the next step. So it's very simple and, you know, succinct, short and just send it out. Yeah. Well, and one thing I, that I, I assume you would be all for, and, and listeners, I'll just tell you, as someone who gets pitches, so it's it's going to be different if it is someone who is editor for Inc., for example. But even with them, if you kind of interact with them on social media yep. before you start yep. pitching, <laughs> you know, so yeah. <laughs> if somebody pitches me and I know their name, and even if it's, I know their name because they're in my free Facebook group and I recognize the name, I'm going to be much more likely to open that and I'm going to be predisposed to, to listen to it. So, you know, it, it takes a little more work, but if you do that process, so you're not cold pitching, I think it, it will help quite a bit. So, yeah, that's such a great tip. And I definitely teach that. I think that that is just, it's a simple thing that you can do that's going to set you apart. And that's why we also try to focus on, 
you know, quality targeted leads on your, you know, publications you want to reach out to versus going for the, you know, mass pitching approach, because that doesn't work. And it also doesn't allow you that opportunity to do the personal connections. It does have an impact. And also as you're connecting on social media, you can share their content and you can give a little one sentence, you know, Twitter, think Twitter, like, you know, one sentence summary, like great strategies, especially number seven, you know, put that in place and had awesome results. Like, thanks for this great article and kind of share it. That gets noticed. It really does get noticed. And thinking about giving before you ask to get. So you want to give support to their article, share it with your audience and get them to notice you. And, And of course, always being genuine in how you do this. And you'll know when it feels right you know, but definitely taking that step to engage and make connections, it has a huge impact. Yeah. And again, it's a little thing. And I think that's why, you know, you talked about small, but quality. Yeah. I, you know, I say the same thing to people on everything, just because realistically it's, I mean, yes, you could just send cold pitches to a thousand people and you might get some results, but you're going to get much better results. If you say, here are the five places I really want to be and put in the work. And I think you'll get better results that way. So I definitely wanted to suggest that. Now you talked about follow-up. What's the follow-up? How many times, how often, you know, and what's the content of the follow-up after your initial pitch? So there isn't any, I wouldn't say there's like hard and fast rules on this. Everybody has a certain tolerance level of what feels not annoying and invasive to them in terms of how many you want to send out. But I would definitely, within the first seven days, send a follow-up email and attach it to the regular email, just kind of reply and include that original email and follow up in a very nice way. Not, you know, not annoying, but if you happen to follow them on social media and you know, like you can see what they're up to sometimes you could say, oh my gosh, I just love you were in Yosemite. I'm taking my kids there this summer. Like your pictures were gorgeous. Um, anyway, I saw that you were traveling. So maybe this email got lost in the shuffle. Just wanted to kind of bump it to the top of your inbox. Would love to, you know, share more about how I can, you know, add value to your community or share these tips with your audience. And then the fo- the final, I would say, send another follow up email a couple days later, couple, you know, up to a week. Like you, you definitely at least send two follow ups if you don't hear anything, and go in it with the mindset of if you don't hear anything, it's not even a no. It's kind of just a not right now. You know, it could just be that the story isn't the right fit right now. So just don't go in the mindset of like this person is annoyed by me and I'm harassing them. And no, you're not. If you have a targeted pitch that's relevant to them and you're following up, you could be helping them. You can be reminding them that they meant to get back to you and your message just got buried. Or you could be jogging their memory that they wanted to get on the phone with you to talk more about your idea. So go in with the mindset of, you know, a a silence or a no isn't a hard no. It's just not right now. And If you send the second follow-up within two weeks and you don't hear anything back, go find another uh, editor at that publication and start the pitch process kind of all over again, you know, and and it could just be that that editor didn't resonate with them or maybe somebody else covers a different beat or a different angle where it would be the right fit for them. So you can, you know, not take a no or the silent treatment as the end of the road of your opportunity with that publication. Yeah. And, and as someone who's gotten pitches, one thing I would say though, don't send the exact same email three times. No, uh, definitely not. <laughs> I've seen people do no. that. I'm like, like, no, stop, stop. Yeah. Well, and definitely, you know, if you follow up, give another little helpful tidbit or something else that could be helpful to them so that you have a reason for following up. You give a little bit more new information or something that, expands on what you have just sent. Just simple, you know, one or two sentences, or I should say, let's say three or four sentences in the follow-up. I mean, I think that's great. Now, I did want to ask you about when you're thinking about where to pitch, one of the resources I used to use and a lot of people talk about is Harrow, Help a Reporter Out. 
Yep. Is that useful? Is that something that people should be following? I think you should be following it for if at a minimum to see how journalists are putting out their queries and what they're interested in knowing about as it relates to you and your business and the topics that you cover, because you may not get a response. I actually sent a Harrow response out today and I never review Harrow, but somebody in my coaching program sent it to me because it was very specifically relevant to me. And I sent it out, you know, very quickly knowing that I probably am not going to get a response. It's hard to get responses that the list goes out to so many people and these editors get bombarded with stuff all the time. I think at a minimum, Harrow is a great way to see how journalists are asking about your topic. It might give you some ideas for how you can pitch yourself to the media. You know, just because they're covering it on one publication, there could be another publication that's that it's relevant for that hasn't thought about that angle. I mean, you're not going to they're not going to run the exact same story, but you can start to see how journalists are positioning your topic and how you can contribute to, to that, you know, overall discussion. Yeah. And I think I sent a few different pitches out and I'm pretty sure I think I got an email or two back. I never got featured anywhere, but again, I was, I'm also very niched. So there aren't a lot of people asking questions about the legal stuff that's specific to entrepreneurs, but I always wondered about whether that was useful or not. So I'm glad to hear that even you as a PR professional, it's like, okay, well, it's, it's useful, but. Yeah, it is. I mean, we're not getting a lot of conversions from, you know, replying to Harrow pitches, but, or I should say Harrow queries, but I think it does help to see what the media is talking about and kind of have your finger on the pulse of the stories that are pending and the angles that journalists are looking to take in your niche. Okay. All right. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's a useful way to look at it. Well, this has been helpful and very useful. And so I want to say thank you, but also, you know, you kind of have, now you have two different audiences that you talk to, right? You have two different avatars. That's right. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I do. I know so, it's great. Well, actually three, right? Three, so yeah. <laughs> I have, so I have a PR agency and right. brands and they're, baby and kids brands, beauty and cosmetics. And we also have health and wellness clients. So I have my retainer based clients, mostly coming to us from referrals. And then in my coaching, I have agency owners where I teach them how to launch, grow and scale profitable agencies. And then I also teach PR, you know, for experts and brands with physical products, how they can do their own PR. And I really believe that Nobody can tell your story better than you. Nobody can position, you know, you can go with an agency that may have contacts and could potentially cut to the chase, but you are in a great position to tell your own story and to think of the right angles for each of these publications that are on your target list. And I teach the approach for how to do that. Yeah. And so walk through, I mean, that, that last one, I think everybody can understand that's basically you teach people like me how to be my own PR agency, which, which is definitely useful. But the agency accelerator, is that just for PR agencies or is it broader than that? It's broader than that. So the core of it is a PR agency because that's what I run, but we also provide social media services for our clients. So we cover that too. But the overall framework that I created, it really serves anybody that's even a freelancer or working inside somebody else's business doing anything related to marketing, social media marketing, you know, creative services and PR. And it gives them a, an approach and like a structure for how to come up with their overall strategy, find clients, onboard clients, you know, doing sales, what do you put in a proposal, all the way to getting them into your agency, onboarding them seamlessly, serving them in a way where they stick around, you know, beyond just a project-based contract. And you create consistent, predictable, recurring retainer revenue. I know you love the retainer model. (laughs) And then building on top of that and going, doing it kind of over and over again, leveraging the results you got, building out a team and, you know, going after bigger better clients with bigger budgets over time because you've developed a deep 
subject matter expertise and you are the go-to in your space. Yeah. Yeah. So basically going from kind of a solopreneur struggling service provider to someone with a thriving agency where hopefully you're working more on your business and less in your business. That's exactly right. Yep. (laughs) Yeah. Which Mm -hmm. is what we all need to be doing. We all need to work on that. So Jen, where can people find you, get more information about you, learn more about what you do and how you can help them? They can find me at generationacademy.com. That's where all of my coaching content sits. And that's generation with a J. And then if they're interested in just kind of seeing how we position the agency, and there are some freebies they can opt into on my agency website, generationpr.com. And I'm all over social media at generationpr. Yeah. And we'll have links to all that in the show notes, listeners, so you can find that. You know, Jen is a great resource. And so I, I hope you'll go and find some information about her. And, and you know, if you're interested in these things and learning more about her, definitely go check her out. Now, Jen, I just want to say thank you again. You gave a lot of great advice and I definitely enjoyed it. But I do want to give you a chance to give kind of a parting piece of advice. I always like to to kind of ask what is something that that a listener could do in say five minutes a day or by the end of the week that would really move their business forward and ideally related to what what you do and your expertise but it doesn't have to be yeah oh my god there's so many things right all the things well yeah, I'd, so I'd say the the main thing is don't you know don't be overwhelmed by all of the stuff and all of the advice out there and like we talked about with the pitching approach just be more narrow and more tailored and more targeted and you will have better publications covering your story and sharing your expertise versus being overwhelmed by the volume of content and volume of opportunities that are out there. And really just in five minutes a day, you can send an article out on your social media and tag a journalist that wrote it that works at a publication that you're interested in having them take a look at your story, feature you, and just do a little bit of that, you know, for maybe two weeks, a little bit of kind of figuring out what you want to be talking about and what's the right fit for you. And then once you have, you know, 10, let's say just start with 10 publications, create a core pitch with just a general idea of what the angle is. And then each one that you send out, just tweak it and tailor it a little bit for the other publication that you're, you know, the, each of the publications you're looking to have consider you. So just keep it simple. Don't get overwhelmed and also realize that there's another, you know, the other person, the person on the other end of the pitch, you know, they might seem big and scary and um, intimidating, but it's, it's a person like you and me, and they are looking for great stories to tell. They're looking for great content to feature. And they also just want their work to be appreciated. So if you can give them that piece of the puzzle, like, you know, I really appreciate and got some great help from the work that you share, that's going to go a long way. Yeah. I, I think that last piece there that you said, I just got, I've got you know, normally I don't stick a pin in something at the in this quick piece of advice at the end, but I've got to put something there. Mm-hmm. And, and it's 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 similar to what something that someone told me recently about sales, which I'd never thought about, which is when you're selling to someone, you're not adversaries. <laughs> Quit thinking like it's, you know, yeah. me and them. And you just said the exact same thing when you're pitching yourself. You're you're being helpful. Understand yeah. that. So don't feel like it's, you know, an, a, a me versus them scenario. So I think yeah. that's that's great advice. Yep. So thank you for your time, Jen. It's been fantastic. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, but thank you for coming on and and offering this great advice and kind of great lessons for my listeners. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me, Bobby. It's been so awesome chatting with you. And listeners, that's it for this week's episode of the Online Genius Podcast. I'll be back next week with another episode in your ear pods. Talk to you later. Thanks for listening to the Online Genius Podcast. Make sure to tune in next week for more great tips, tricks, and strategies to help you build and protect your online genius.